Good morning. Welcome to the NPTEL sponsored series on manufacturing process 2. Today we are going to do the lecture number 9.6 that is module number 9 non-traditional manufacturing and this is the concluding lecture of this particular module as well as this particular lecture series on manufacturing process 2. Today we are going to study electron beam and laser beam machining. They are called in short EBM and LBM. Before starting any lecture, thus far we have gone through the instructional objectives that is what you are going to learn after going through this particular lecture. In any non-traditional manufacturing process, mechanism of material removal is very, very important. Whatever we have studied in this module, generally we cover what is the basic mechanism of material removal and that also we are going to study today specifically for today's topic electron beam and laser beam welding. Electron beam and laser beam welding, laser beam machining for carrying out that we need equipments. So, we have to study what are the major components of those equipments in electron beam machining and laser beam machining. Then we are going to concentrate on the working principle of electron beam machining and laser beam machining. Then once we have studied the working principle, we will try to schematically represent the EBM and LBM equipments. In any non-traditional manufacturing process, be it EBM or LBM or for that matter electrochemical machining, electro discharge machining, identification of process parameters are very, very important. So, today also we are going to see what are the process parameters and we are going to study to some extent what is the effect of those process parameters on the machining characteristics of EBM and LBM. Like all other machining processes, non-traditional machining processes, here also we are going to see what are the applications, advantages and limitations. Now, let us very briefly go through the classification of non-traditional machining processes. They are mechanical processes, electrochemical processes, electrothermal processes, chemical processes. Already we have studied quite a few mechanical processes under this lecture series. We have for example, studied abrasive jet machining, ultrasonic machining, water jet machining as well as abrasive water jet machining. Within electrochemical processes, we have studied in detail electrochemical machining processes. Today, our process is under the category electrothermal processes. Even within electrothermal processes, already we have studied electro discharge machining. Today, we are going to concentrate on electron beam machining and laser beam machining. These two process though belong to electrothermal process, they can also be described as electro optico thermal processes. Why? Because both in electron beam and laser beam welding, ultimately we generate a beam of electron, high velocity, high energy or in case of laser beam machining, a beam of photons. Thus, it is also can be classified as electro optico or optical thermal process. Now, both these two processes, they are basically like other non-traditional processes, they are basically high energy density process. What do you mean by high energy density process? In this particular graph, this is my spot diameter in micron. That means, wherever is 10 to the power 3 is written, this is around 1 millimeter, this is around 10 millimeter and this is the power density of the process in question, watt per millimeter square. There are five different zones shown in this already some of the processes we have studied. Say for example, this particular process is called electro discharge process. So, as in case of electro discharge process, the spot size is really very less. 
the power density is very very high. This one is of interest to us today. This particular sector belongs to laser beam processing or laser beam machining. I would rather use the word processing because other than machining as we go through the lecture we will find out laser beam can also be used for other kind of processing. Here as you can see the typical spot size is around 0 0.1 milli millimeter or 100 micron both of them they are same and the power density is rather high. It can be as high as 10 to the power 6 watt per millimeter square or 1 megawatt per millimeter square. The total energy involved is not high, but as because the spot size, as because the spot size is less, the power density becomes very, very large. This very large domain that is shown here, this belongs to electron beam processes and that is of interest to us. When electron beam machining is done, typically we do not go towards this. We concentrate towards a millimeter or submillimetric spot size so that a very large power density can be obtained. This one here is for gas free beams, say for example, oxyacetylene beams and this one here is corresponding to welding arcs. So, this is the basic classification or characteristics of high energy density processes and out of those high energy density processes, two of them we are going to study today. One is laser beam machining, another one is electron beam machining. Now, as I said earlier, both laser beam machining and electron beam machining, they are equipment intensive processes. The equipment is the heart of the process and we need to study those equipments. In electron beam machining, the electron beam gun which generates the beam of electron is the heart of the equipment. Let us see how it is fabricated. Now, electron beam gun first and foremost operates under vacuum. So, this whole structure whatever has been shown this whole structure is under vacuum. This particular part is my cathode. This cathode is made up either tungsten or tantalum. These are filament type cathodes. Potential difference is applied across this filament so that the filament temperature goes around 2500 degree centigrade. At such high temperature and moreover under vacuum, there would be emission of thermoionic electrons. Moreover, this particular cathode is highly negatively biased. This is negatively biased and this is your high voltage supply to your cathode. So, through this section the high voltage supply comes. So, once this filament goes to this temperature, electrons are emitted thermoionically as the cathode is negatively biased, they are repelled from the cathode. Just after the cathode, you have once again a biased grid. This bias grid is very, very important in construction of the electron beam gun because it controls the flow of electron. It controls the flow of electron. This bias grid typically is negatively biased so that electrons do not get collected on it or rather they are concentrated. Just following the bias grid, you have a positively biased anode. This is my anode. So, this is positively biased. So, what happens? Electrons are negative, anode is there. So, anode, because of the potential difference between the anode and the cathode, the electrons 
are accelerated. As they pass, as the electron pass through this particular section, the anode section, they achieve a velocity which is almost half of the velocity of light. So, when they are passing through this particular section, they are highly energetic. Just following the anode, you have two more things. One is called magnetic lenses. These are magnets and these are magnetic lenses. What is the function of magnetic lenses? They serve the same function as that of any lens, which is to concentrate or focus a beam of light, but we do not have a beam of light here. We have a beam of electron. So, these magnetic lenses, they would focus or concentrate the beam of electron. So, gradually the electron beam would be very concentrated and they will start moving through this particular section. But some of the electrons may diverge for whatever reason. So, just after the magnetic lenses, we have an aperture. It is just like an aperture of an optical camera, but the purpose of this one is a bit different. Whatever stray electrons are available here, the aperture will capture those stray electrons, so that the electron beam which emerges from this section, they are very, very concentrated and focused. There is no stray electrons. Further down the line, you have a electromagnetic lens. which ultimately focuses the electron beam onto your workpiece. Your workpiece would be somewhere here. Your workpiece would be somewhere here, which we will be explaining once again in a later slide. Your workpiece would be somewhere here. So, that electromagnetic lens would basically be concentrating the electron beam or focusing the electron beam on the electrode. This particular piece of small coil is known as deflector coils. These deflector coils can deflect the electron beam by my small amount and so that you can correct if there is, if you are not getting a proper hole shape. Two more instruments we have not mentioned here, possibly I can uh, take a fresh slate and these are these two, this one as well as this one. This is called illumination system and this is a telescope. This illumination system and telescope, they are used simultaneously. Why they are used? To align the electron beam with the work. This is the requirement of the illumination system and the telescope. What else do we have here? Here we have a port. As I said earlier, electron beam gun operates under vac vacuum. So, this particular port is for measuring the pressure or monitoring the pressure. So, this is vacuum gauge port for mounting my vacuum gauge. There is another port as can be seen here. This is my diffusion pump port. Diffusion pump is a vacuum pump which maintains vacuum within the electron beam chamber. What is the level of vacuum? Level of vacuum is 10 to the power minus 4 to 10 to the power minus 6 torr. I hope you must be knowing that 1 torr is equivalent to 1 mm Hg pressure. That means the pressure of 1 millimeter of mercury is 1 torr. And we are maintaining 10 to the power minus 4 to 10 to the power minus 6 torr within the electron beam gun. So, this is the construction of the EB gun. Always I am saying electron beam guns are operated under vacuum. Why they are operated under vacuum? If they are not operated under vacuum, first and foremost from the cathode, if you remember this is my cathode, we would not have thermionic emission. In even if we have thermionic emission, those electrons will collide with the air molecules and they would not be accelerated to that extent. They would, there would be too many number of collisions with air molecules and they will lose their energy. That is the reason electron beam guns or electron beam machining as such is carried out under vacuum. There is another small piece of 
equipment that we have not yet mentioned this one. This is the slotted disc, what is it? This is slotted disc, what is the purpose of slotted disc? Whenever we are machining with the electron beam, material removal occurs because of vaporization and melting. Those vapors should not enter my electron beam or should not obstruct the optical windows of the electron beam gun. So, there is a slotted disc and they are synchronized with the electron beam and always it will allow the electron beam to interact with the workpiece but it would not allow any vapor of the workpiece to obstruct the windows of the electron beam gun. There is another piece of information which is very, very essential. In electron beam machining, the gun is operated in pulse mode, unlike in electron beam welding where it is operated on continuous mode. So, how is it operated in pulse mode? That can also be explained from this diagram. If you remember, this one was your cathode, this one was your bias grid. We have already mentioned this is a negatively biased grid, but this negative bias is not continuous, it is in pulse mode. As this bias is in pulse mode, this bias grid controls the flow of electron. So, whenever there is a bias, appropriate bias, it will allow the flow of electron. In other time when it is not appropriately biased, it would not allow flow of electrons. And in that way, we can operate almost similar electron beam gun in continuous mode, which is required in electron beam welding or in pulse mode, which is the topic of today electron beam machining, which is required in electron beam machining. Now, already we have discussed the different modules of electron beam gun just in the previous slide. Just to summarize that, let us identify them once again. We require, as we have mentioned earlier, a cathode. It is typically in the form of a cartridge. We have also mentioned the cathode is made of tungsten or tantalum. These are in the form of filaments. There has to be a high voltage power supply, so that the cathode is negatively biased, so that whatever thermionic emission of electron takes place, they are repelled from the cathode. There is a bias grid, mostly it is supplied with a pulsed bias, so that we can operate the instrument in pulse mode. Following the bias grid, there is an anode magnetic lenses which concentrate the beam, aperture which captures the stray electrons. It captures the stray electrons. Why do they capture? So that we get a focused beam or a concentrated, focused and concentrated beam. Then you have electromagnetic coils which actually works as a focusing lens. Then we have deflector coils which can deflect the beam by small amount. We require a lightning sy lighting system or illumination system and telescope for alignment. We also require rotating slotted discs so that the electron beam gun does not get damaged because of production of vapor during machining. And as it has been mentioned number of times, the whole system has to be under vacuum. And who maintains that vacuum within the gauge, within the electron beam gun? That is maintained by rotary pump and diffusion pump. That means, diffusion pump becomes a very, very important module in electron beam machining or in the electron beam construction of the electron beam gun. So, we need to study what is this diffusion pump and how it works. So, this is the slide depicting the construction and working principle of diffusion pump. What do I have here? Here we have a boiler. Is it a boiler like a steam, boil, steam thing? No, it is a small boiler containing oil. Just below that we have a heater. 
So, as we are heating the oil, oil vapors should be produced and those oil vapors would start going up. Just above those oil vapors, we have a structure which is called a set of nozzles and further a part of the diffusion pump is connected to something which is called backing line, which is in turn connected to a rotary pump. Rotary pump is also a vacuum pump, but it can maintain vacuum which is not so high. So, what happens when we heat the oil? The oil vapor starts going up. As they reach this particular section, their momentum is reversed and they come out as a high velocity jet through this part. Similarly, they come out from this section, they come out from this section, they also come out from this section. This side of the diffusion pump is connected to my electron beam gun. So, if there is any residual air molecule, because of the momentum of this oil jet, these air molecules would be entrained in the jet and gradually everything would be removed through this backing line via the rotary pump. And in this way, within the electron beam chamber, which was here, within the electron beam chamber, this is the connection for diffusion pump. So, within this chamber, we will be getting vacuum in tune of 10 to the power minus 4 to 10 to the power minus 6 torque. To help proper working of the diffusion pump, we have a series of cooling coils, which helps, which helps in condensation of these oil vapors in a very nice manner and entrainment of any residual air. And this cooling coils, through this cooling, cooling coils, cold water would be passed continuously. So, diffusion pump is also another very important part of electron beam gun, which maintains for appropriate vacuum within the chamber. Now, let us have a look at the mechanism of material removal in electron beam machine. So, what we have till now? Till now, we have a gun. This is the gun. We have already described its fabrication as well as how it produces electron beam. This, if you remember, is the slotted disk and the electron beam comes and impinges on my work piece. So, this is my work piece. Just below the work piece, you require auxiliary material. This requirement of auxiliary material would be explained in the next slide. So, how does it machine? As we apply high voltage to the cathode as well as to the filament, we get emission of thermionic electrons. These thermionic electrons are repelled by the cathode and attracted by the anode through the bias grid. So, they are accelerated and they are accelerated almost to half the velocity of light. So, we get a high velocity, high energy beam of electrons. These electrons beam is shaped and focused by a series of magnetic and electromagnetic lenses. And finally, this electron beam impinges with high velocity and high energy on the workpiece. Typically, the spot size would be around 10 to 100 micron. So, the density would be very high. The density could be as high as 10 to the power 4 watt per millimeter square. It could be as high as. On impingement, the electrons, the kinetic energy of the electron would be absorbed by the workpiece, which will lead to heating, melting and finally, vaporization leading to, as you can see in the small schematic, leading to drilling, as has been schematically shown here. This has been explained in a better manner in the next slide. So, once the electrons are impinging, what happens? Because of the kinetic energy being transferred into the thermal energy, we have localized heating by the focused electron beam. So, this is my localized heating. 
this is my localized heating. Then what happens? Then gradual formation of the hole because of penetration of your melt vaporization front. As localized heating takes place, the melt vaporization front develops here and it gets starts to penetrate and finally, it penetrates till the auxiliary material. This is your auxiliary material and this is your workpiece material. Here severe melting and vaporization is taking place. Auxiliary material melts very fast and produces vapor. So, if there is any molten metal in the path, it ejects that molten metal forming a proper hole leading to electron beam machining or electron beam drilling. So, because of the presence of auxiliary material, there will be tremendous high vapor pressure which removes any molten material, molten workpiece material leading to formation of the hole. Now, let us have a look at the process parameters in electron beam machining. First process parameter is the accelerating voltage. Where is that accelerating voltage? Between my anode and my cathode, I have a accelerating voltage. How much could be the accelerating voltage? It could be hundreds of kilo volts. Then you have beam current that is the current flowing between the cathode and your workpiece here that is your beam current. Then you have the pulse duration that is how often or for what duration you put a pulsed bias on the bias grid that is very important because only during that phase you are allowing your electron beam to impinge on the workpiece. Now, if someone multiplies these two, you will get a energy per pulse in the range of 100 joule per pulse. So, power per pulse is also important as energy per pulse is important. Next comes the lens current. This lens current will determine to what extent the electron beam is focused. It has to be focused. This is my electron beam. This has to be focused. For focusing this, I need to pass large amount of lens currents to the electromagnetic lenses. This is my electromagnetic lens. That determines my spot size. Spot size is typically from 10 micron to 100 micron or even 500 micron. This spot size ultimately would determine my power density. So, what is my power density? This is my power density. This is a derived variable which basically indicates how fast can I machine. Power density is nothing but the kinetic energy or kinetic power of the electron beam because this is mass flow rate of the electrons over divided by the spot size area. If my spot size is larger, power density would be less. If my spot size is higher, power density would be high. In other words, as far as the in terms of process parameters, how come the power is decided? Power is decided by accelerating voltage, beam current and pulse duration. See, this is my accelerating voltage, beam current and pulse duration. This is my total power in a particular pulse and this is my spot size that is the area. So, that gives me the power density. This power density is the most important parameter, a derived parameter which governs the rate of material removal in electron beam machining. Now, let us come to machining characteristics. In any non-traditional machining process, there are machining characteristics. In electron beam machining, the shape of the hole is the machining characteristics. So, what is there to study? This is my workpiece that is supported on auxiliary material. Typically what happens? Typically the problem in electron beam machining, the main characteristics is this formation of what is called, what you can see here, recast layer at the entry. 
formation of recast or resolidified layer at the entry. In electron machining, in electron beam machining, we are getting this hole. How we are getting this hole? We are getting this hole because of melting and vaporization of the material. As because there is melting at the entry through this port, the vapor and the molten material is they are being expelled. In the process, when there is no pulse, there is no heat input, there can be solidification, resolidification at the entry. So, what are the issues here? Issues are these. There could be tapering as it has been seen in this particular diagram. There is requirement of auxiliary support material. There could be recast layer at the entry. Generally, in electron beam machining, there is no bar formation. As electron beam machining is done, the pulse duration already we have mentioned microsecond to millisecond. Over that small duration of time, there is minimum amount of heat affected zone. This is what heat affected zone. This amount could be hardly very, very less, it is in tens of microns. Now, electron beam machining as I have already indicated is mainly used for drilling operation. So, in electron beam machining, you can get a diameter of 100 micron to 2 millimeter. L by D ratio achievable is 10 to 15, so it is very good. Almost any material can be machined in electron beam machining. Here, we have shown that the angle is 90 degree, is it not? This angle we have shown as 90 degree. But this can drilling can also be done at a shallower angle, at small angle of 20 degree. Plane of focusing generally is here at the top of the material, but the plane of focusing can also be inside the material and that can affect your tapering leading to reverse tapering. Now, let us come to electron beam speed characteristics, how fast we can machine. This is your this is your volume of material removal or volume of hole and this is how fast you can machine number of holes per second. So, as the volume increases it is expected you can machine less number of holes, but there are two different zones shown. This is typically for ferrous alloys and this is for titanium and as well as aluminum alloys, meaning thereby for the same material removal, I can machine faster in case of titanium and aluminum. Definitely aluminum melts much faster at a much lower temperature, so it requires less energy. In case of titanium, however, its thermal conductivity is poor. So, the energy is concentrated, it is not diffused. So, once again we can machine at a faster rate for the same volume of material removal. Now, let us come to the advantages of EBM processes. What are the advantages? Very high rate of drilling, it can machine almost any material. There is no mechanical force, so fixturing is very easy. As because there is no mechanical force, it can machine fragile and brittle materials. Heat affected zone in electron beam machining is very, very small. Why? Because we are using very short pulses, it is not a continuous machining process. Holes of almost any shape can be drilled. How? By using that deflector coils and the CNC table just below the EBM. What are the limitations of EBM? One of the major limitation is the high capital cost and there is another limitation. What is that? Any vacuum system requires maintenance and here also you are having a vacuum system. And once again, you have non-productive pump down times because of the back presence of vacuum system. This can be to some extent reduced by using load locks. Heat affectant zone, though it is rather less, but there is some amount of resolidified material formation at the entry, if you remember, which quite often is taken as the limitation of electron beam machining. Now, let us come to laser beam. Today, we are going to cover two processes. One is electron beam machining, another one is laser beam machining. Now, let us go into the laser beam machining. What is laser? Laser is known as light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, that is laser. 
when laser was conceived, not actually made, but when people understood that laser can be made. In 1917, Einstein understood the basic working principle of laser. However, only in 1960, industrial lasers were manufactured and they were put to use. Wavelength of the laser is in this region. It is submicronic to tens of microns. Power density, it is a high energy density process, could be as high as, as we have indicated earlier, 1 megawatt per millimeter square. It is very interesting that laser has to be used on materials where it absorbs laser energy. Upon absorption of the laser energy, there is rapid rise in the temperature, leading once again to melting and vaporization and material removal. So, material removal process in laser beam, laser beam machining is very similar to electron beam machining. In the sense, once the laser energy is absorbed, there will be rapid rise in temperature, melting and evaporation and material removal. Now, what is the working principle of laser? Working principle of laser depends on stimulated emission. Generally, an atom may absorb energy that is called spontaneous absorption followed by spontaneous emission. This spontaneous absorption and emission process, the time duration is in nanoseconds. However, there is something called stimulated absorption leading to metastable state of electron population inversion and stimulated emission. This gives phase coherent laser or beam of photon. They are coherent not only in temporal mode, but also in spatial mode. We will go into this in details in next few slides. This one shows what we have mentioned earlier, spontaneous absorption and emission. This is a particular electron in the ground state this particular electron is in the ground state. It absorbs energy spontaneously and goes into a higher energy state, but it does not stay in the higher energy state for a long time. It comes back to the ground state and in the process emits a photon. The same thing has been explained here by energy bands. So, this photon would be having an energy of h nu and that energy is equivalent to the energy gap between ground state and the higher energy state. So, E 1 minus E 0. So, if I can write it here, E 1 minus E 0 equal to H nu, where nu is the frequency of that particular electron. This process takes nanosecond. However, you can also put electrons in the higher energy state by something which is called stimulated absorption. A photon is irradiating a particular material the energy of the photon goes to the electron and it moves from ground state to the higher energy state. And then this material is having electrons at higher energy state. This energy, this electron can come down once again to the lower energy and there would be a emission of photon. This is called spontaneous emission, but before that there is a stimulated absorption. Then what is stimulated emission? already in the material, you have lot many electrons in the higher energy state. This is called population inversion. Generally, electrons are not in higher energy state. Somehow, by doing stimulated absorption, you have put lot of electrons in the higher energy state. Then what are you doing? That material you are irradiating with a photon. This photon energy, if it matches with this energy gap, would stimulate, this is very, very important, this electron to come down to the ground state and at the end of that, you would have two photons having same temporal and spatial coherence. This is the emission or stimulated emission which leading to formation of laser beam. How is it done actually? This has been explained in the gas laser mode. Here you have a gas laser or a gas inside a tube that is excited by electrical discharge. There is a electric two and one cathode and one anode. Electrical discharge is established in the rarefied gas. What happens? They would be going to the higher energy state and they would come down in process. Gradually, 
you would have lot of coherent photons coming out one by one and number of photons will increase. Now, in this side you have on the other side what you have is a 50 percent or partially reflected mirror and on this side you have a totally reflected mirror. So, a photon when it goes there may get reflected back and it once again can stimulate another photon to come out from the higher energy electron. Once it reaches here they, re they get reflected back into the chamber as because this is partially reflected mirror after some time you would have a coherent beam of laser a coherent beam of laser coming out. Now, let us see what are the different types of lasers and the lasing medium that is what is used as the laser. There are two different kinds of lasing medium, one is called gas laser, the other one is called solid state laser. Typically helium, neon, argon and carbon dioxide lasers are used. Carbon dioxide laser is the most industrially used laser having a wavelength of 10.6 micron. As far as solid state lasers are used, you have ruby laser, India glass, ND glass laser and ND EAG laser. This ND yttrium aluminum garnet laser, this is an, once again another very popular laser having a wavelength of 10.06 micron. So, they are exactly one tenth of that. Now, how a solid state laser works? Say for example, what we have here is a solid state schematic of a solid state laser. This particular part say is my ruby rod. So, that is my lasing medium. Around that I have a flash tube. This is my flash tube. This flash tube pumps, optically pumps energy within the ruby rod so that electrons which are at ground state can be put to the higher energy state and this is the housing. How it works? Once again, this is my flash tube, this is my ruby rod. This flash tube pumps energy within the ruby rod to create the population inversion. How it is done? There is a capacitor from a supply, this capacitor is charged and discharged. The charging time and discharging time is determined by this register and there is a switch. This switch initiates the first emission and you get a laser beam which interacts with your work piece. How it is done in a gas laser? In gas laser also we need to do the population inversion. So, this is my laser tube through which continuously carbon dioxide, nitrogen and helium is used. What for carbon dioxide is used? Carbon dioxide is my, is my lasing medium, this is my lasing medium. Nitrogen and helium they are used as a coolant gas and support gases. So, you have nit carbon dioxide mixture of carbon dioxide, nitrogen and helium going through this particular port and coming out through this particular port. What else do you have? Here you have an anode and here you have a cathode where you apply high energy uh, sorry high voltage to the anode and the cathode so that a electrical discharge is established between these two electrodes. These electrical energy of the electrical discharge pumps the gas molecules from the ground state to the higher energy state and as they come out it leads to stimulated emission leading to the formation of the laser beam. This is the typical working principle of carbon dioxide laser. As you can see there would be lot many especially in the previous diagram it was very clear there would be lot many photons which are going in hayward direction they do not have the coherency because they need not be emitted in the same direction. These photons as they interact with the medium or the glass tube does produce lot of heat that heat is taken out by flowing coolant through this. This helium and nitrogen also provides some amount of internal cooling to the gas. Now, carbon dioxide laser maintenance as well as use is very easy, but there is one problem. What is that problem? Typically for 100 watt of power, this length is around 1 meter. So, it is 100 watt per meter is the length of the tube. 
if that is the situation, what can you do? If you have to make a carbon dioxide laser which is 10 kilowatt, what would be this length? This length would be 100 meters, so that is not at all acceptable. So, we have to develop a design where we can get the benefit of high power carbon dioxide laser without going into 100 meters. That is done by something which is called folded, folded gas laser. So, we have a series of individual gas laser tube, this is one laser tube, this is another laser tube, possibly here also there could be a laser tube. What happens? This is the first one. This one is a 100 percent mirror, this is a turning mirror. So, laser coming out of this, this particular tube is fed back into the next one. So, this possibly produces 100 watt or 200 watt. This one gets that particular beam and passes through this one. So, ultimately 400 watt comes out. So, what is the basic principle? We have series of 1, 2, 3, 4, one upon a, one after another laser tube. So, this is called folded gas laser. Once again, here also we have a power supply, here the gas flow lines have not been shown, but we have gas flow lines as well. And ultimately, you have a output mirror, here only two fold has been shown, but here you can build lasers which are five fold, six fold and increase the total power from the gas laser. Now, what is the mechanism of material removal? As we have already told earlier, the mechanism of material removal in laser machining is very similar to electron beam machining. In electron beam machining, what we have is a high energy beam of electron that interacts with the work material. The kinetic energy of the electron gets transferred into the heat energy. Here also, the energy of the photons or the laser beam has to be absorbed by the work material. Once the energy of the beam is absorbed by the work material, what would happen? We would have increase in the, we would have increase in the temperature, because the energy of the laser beam is converted into heat energy and this is my work piece material, where we would have increase in temperature. This increase in temperature would lead to melting as well as evaporation depending on what is your material leading to material removal. In case of carbon dioxide laser, which is mainly used for cutting action, which can also be called slitting option, slitting action. We can also use gas assist for enhancing the material removal. So, material removal mechanism in LBM is similar to electron beam machining. Now, let us come to some common characteristics of laser beam or different types of laser. As it has been said, the most common laser is ND EAG laser and carbon dioxide laser. ND EAG laser is a solid state laser, carbon dioxide laser is a gas laser. What is there in ND EAG? It is basically a doped laser. You have yttrium, garn, aluminum and garnet and that is doped with 1 percent ND. Carbon dioxide laser is also not full 100 percent carbon dioxide. You have carbon dioxide, helium and nitrogen. The lasing medium is carbon dioxide, but helium and nitrogen acts as a support gas as well as internal cooling. How they are different from each other? This is having a wavelength of 1.06 micron, whereas this is just 10 times 10.6 micron. However, efficiency of carbon dioxide laser is bit better than the efficiency of NDAG laser. Generally, NDAG lasers are used in pulse mode. This word generally is very, very important. They can also be used in other modes, but generally they are used in pulse mode and carbon dioxide laser is used in continuous mode, that is continuous irradiation. Spot size is this one, in better other words, it is around 15 microns. So, it is very, very less. In case of carbon dioxide laser, it is around 75 micron, so almost 0 0.1 millimeter and this is almost 0 0.01 micron, 0 0.01 millimeter, it is very, very less. As because this is used in pulse mode, the pulse repetition rate is 1 hertz, that once per second 
to even 300 pulses per second. Carbon dioxide as we have already told is used in continuous mode. Now, let us come to the beam output. Beam power output is around maximum 10 to 1 kilowatt, whereas in case of carbon dioxide, it is around 100 watt to 10 kilowatts. There are carbon dioxide lasers which are even larger. Peak power available is around 400 kilowatt. This is bit different. This is beam output and this is peak power because the output as because it is work and as because it is used in pulse mode, you get lot of peak power. In case of carbon dioxide, peak power is around 100 kilowatt, but nats normally they are in this range. Now, let us come to the applications of laser beam. Laser beam can be used for a host of purposes. As far as machining is concerned, it can be used for material removal, it can be used for drilling, it can be used for tree panning, it can be used for cutting, it can be used for other material processing as well. For example, welding, cladding, alloying and bending. Laser drilling can be done using continuous laser, that means what? using carbon dioxide laser. Pulse laser can also be used, that means primarily use of nd yag laser. Okay. Now, this drilling as far as the cutting is concerned or even tree panning is concerned, this would be done by carbon dioxide laser. With grass assist, that is with flow of oxygen or without gas assist. Both of them are possible. Whenever we are cutting, we are not very bothered about, we have to cut very fast rather than very uh, without any heat affected zone and all and that requires the uh, gas assist which enhances the cutting speed. Now, let us come to the applications. As I said, different types of lasers can be used for thick cutting, typically carbon dioxide is used. For thin slitting of materials, NDAG is used. For thin slitting of plastics, carbon dioxide is used. So, in this way, different types of applications can be undertaken with laser. Now, let us come to the advantages of laser beam machining. What are the advantages of laser beam machining? Micro holes can be drilled not only in easy to machine materials, but also in difficult to machine materials. That is very important. Though laser processing is a thermal processing, but heat affected zone, especially in pulsed laser processing is not very significant. This particular point is very, very important. In case of continuous machining, using continuous lasers like carbon dioxide, you would have significant amount of heat affected zone. But using NDAC type of lasers, which are used in pulse mode, due to duration of the pulse, very short duration of the pulse, you would not have that much of heat affected zone. In laser machining, there is no physical tool. Say for example, in electrochemical machining, electro discharge machining, though they are non-traditional machining process, you have physical tools. As because there is no physical tool, there is no machining force or wear taking place on the tail. It not only can produce micro holes, but it can also produce holes where aspect ratio is very, very large with acceptable accuracy, both dimensional form and location. This can be done by laser beam machining. Now, is there any limitation in laser beam machining? Yes, there are limitation. First and foremost, there is high capital cost. Be it carbon dioxide laser, NDAC laser, you have a high capital cost. Not only that, you have a high maintenance cost as well in laser beam machining. From the energy point of view, unfortunately, it is not very efficient. Its advantages are it can machine almost any material, but from energy point of view, it is not very, very efficient. As far as carbon dioxide laser cutting is concerned, especially with oxygen gas assist, there would be presence of heat affected zone. One of the major limitation of laser beam machining, which is its characteristics and its limitation, that it is a thermal process. Such, it is as because it is a thermal process, it cannot be used for machining heat sensitive materials. Say for example, here you have a heat sensitive material, 
where this particular color represents a resin, this is a laminated structure. If this has to be machined by laser, then, then this resin would be easily eaten away by the heat of the laser and it cannot be, it is not acceptable. So, though it has got its advantages, but it is also being a thermal process, it is not suitable for heat sensitive materials. Now, let us come to the summary. We have already discussed the major components of electron beam and laser beam equipment. We have discussed working principle. After going through this lecture, you can draw the EBM and LBM equipments. We have identified the process parameters. We know the basic mechanism of material removal and most important you know application advantages and limitation. Before concluding, let us go to a, through a quick cue, uh, quiz. Mechanism of material removal in electron beam machining is due to what? We all know it is because of melting and vaporization due to thermal effect of impingement of high energy electron. So, answer is D. Mechanism of material in laser beam machining, we have e said number of times, once again it is because of melting and vaporization. So, this is my answer, answer is C. Then comes the third question, generally electron beam gun is operated, we all said that it is operated under vacuum and this is my level of vacuum, 10 to the power minus 4 to 10 to the power minus 6 torr, which is nothing but this milliton. So, answer is D. Laser beam is produced due to what? It is produced due to population inversion and stimulated emission. So, spontaneous absorption leading to population inversion followed by stimulated emission. This is the mechanism of production of laser beam. Today, we are coming to an end of this module. Not only that, this is the last lecture of NPTEL sponsored manufacturing process. Two, within this module, we have learnt about non-traditional manufacturing processes. While starting this particular module, initially I tried to make the difference between conventional and non-traditional manufacturing, the characteristics difference. And then we have studied the major non-traditional processes. We have studied abrasive jet process. If you remember, this was a mechanical process. Ultrasonic process machining, this was mechanical. Water jet and abrasive, both of them, they are mechanical processes. Then we went into electrochemical, followed by electro discharge. And today, we have completed electron beam and laser beam process. This is not the end of non-traditional manufacturing. This should be the beginning of non-traditional manufacturing as far as you are concerned. There are other non-traditional machining process. Hopefully, jointly we have made a good progress in the area of non-traditional manufacturing and we will keep on learning from other sources regarding the other process. Thank you so much.